complexity of the molecular orbital model gets higher as additional molecular orbitals must be created when your molecules get larger. So this is the case when we get to molecules composed of second period elements. Now you can have valence electrons in either the 2s or both the 2s and the 2p atomic orbitals. So we're going to have to come up with linear combination products of these atomic orbitals to generate our MOs. Let's start by talking first about elements in the first and second groups in the second period, right? So both these elements, lithium, beryllium, for example, are going to have their valence electrons in the s orbital. So the way you build the MOs from these s atomic orbitals is shown here, and they're pretty much the same as the two MOs that we saw in the period one elements with the 1s atomic orbital. The only difference is that these MOs that we have, which is sigma ns, where n represents the period number, and sigma ns star, is just going to be larger. So if you have sigma 2s and sigma 2s star, those are larger than the sigma 1s and sigma 1s star MOs. The more complex situation really comes about when we have 2p atomic orbitals. Here we can have different types of MOs form, as I'll discuss in a second. Now one thing to note is of course that each p orbital has two lobes with opposite phases, which is usually given by the difference in the color of those lobes. There are two different types of MOs that you can have. One type of MO is formed by a linear combination of head-to-head -head p orbitals, which in this drawing is your px orbital. So just like with the s orbitals, we can imagine the process of linear combination as wave addition, both in phase and out of phase. So when we add it one way, we get a bonding MO that's called the sigma 2p, which has this shape right here. And then we get the anti-bonding MO if we do it as an out of phase addition, and that one is called the sigma 2p star. Now, similar to the discussion with the period one MOs, the reason this one is the bonding is because you have an increased electron density in between the two nuclei resulting in attraction of the two nuclei to the electron in the middle whereas the antibonding has a nodal plane in this case right in the middle that prevents those two nuclei from coming together because there's no electron to attract them. Now both of these orbitals are called sigma molecular orbitals because the electron density is symmetric around the bond axis right so even though they have different colors but when you rotate the top to the bottom you get the same color, which means they are the same face. Now what about the other two p orbitals here, the one that's vertical, which is colored in black here, and then the one that's red, which is in front and to the back of the plane of the screen. These two p orbitals make what we call a side-to-side -side linear combination as shown in this picture here. When you do the addition in face, you're going to get the MO on the left, which is this shape right here, and then when you do the out of phase addition, you're going to get this this shape for the MOs. Now these are called pi MOs, not sigma MOs, because as you can see for both of these MOs you now have a nodal plane. So see that white space right there where the bond axis is, that's the nodal plane and if you recall when we have a nodal plane between the two nuclei we call that the pi bond in the valence bond model so we're going to apply that same definition here and call this the pi molecular orbital. They're pi 2p because they are the result of linear combination of 2p orbitals. Now the MO on the left is energetically lower and more stable compared to the one on the right because in the one on the left you still see the electron density in between the two nuclei. So again that means that the electrons are going to attract both of the nuclei to come closer together stabilizing the molecule. Whereas the other molecular orbital has a node in between the two nuclei which again means that it doesn't have anything that would bring the two nuclei closer together. So we would label the one on the left pi 2p and the one on the right as the antibonding pi 2p star. So just to briefly summarize, for the period 2 MOs, we're going to get eight molecular orbitals that are formed by the eight atomic orbitals, right? Eight atomic orbitals coming from 4 and 4 with 1, S, and 3 P orbitals from each atom. Now the lists are given right here, so keep that in mind. Now we're going to talk about the relative stabilities of these MOs. Now the issue here is unlike atomic orbitals where the relative stability of orbitals is consistent across all 
all the elements. So in other words, the 2s is always more stable than the 2p, and the 2p is always more stable than 3s and so on. We actually see variation in stability of these MOs depending on where you're located in the periodic table. Now specifically for the period 2, we have two different energy diagrams that we have to keep in mind. So if the nuclear charge, which is z, is smaller or equal to 7, so these are elements like boron, carbon, and nitrogen, then you're going to have to use this energy diagram. Whereas if your elements that make up your molecule is bigger, meaning that it has a nuclear charge of 8 or more, which really just means oxygen, fluorine, and neon, then you're going to use the energy diagram on the top. Now the difference of the two energy diagrams is highlighted by these arrows here, which is just this part. So for the smaller ones, you get the pi 2p orbitals to be lower in energy compared to sigma 2p, whereas for the bigger nuclear charge, you have the sigma 2p being more stable than the pi 2p orbitals. The pi 2p's are degenerate, right? So there's two of them and that's why they're drawn that way. Now why is there a flip or a switch in the stabilities of these two molecular orbitals, the sigma and the pi 2p. It actually has to do with this con concept we call SNP mixing, which is a little advanced, but we'll talk about it briefly here. So when we talk about electron configuration of atoms, right, we always list the ranking of the atomic orbitals in terms of their stabilities the same way. So we say that 1s is lower than 2s, 2s is lower than 2p, etc. as I said just now. Now this is true in general for each element, but it's also true that the relative stability of the same orbital, so for example the 2s orbital, is not the same in different elements. So for example, if you look here, this is an MO diagram for carbon monoxide, which is a combination of carbon and oxygen. So what we can see here is the atomic orbital for carbon and the atomic orbital for oxygen. And what you see is the position of the 2s orbital for carbon is actually much higher in energy compared to the position of the 2s atomic orbital for oxygen. And the reason is because oxygen has a larger nuclear charge, which means it's going to attract the 2s electron closer. So that causes it to have a much more stable 2s electrons compared to the 2p. Whereas with carbon, because the nuclear charge is not as strong, both of them are feeling some attraction, but it doesn't differentiate as greatly as in the case of oxygen. Now, the result of these differences in the separation of the atomic orbitals comes about when you're doing the linear combination to make your molecular orbital. Because of the closeness in energy, the s and the p here will both contribute to the linear combination process a lot more than the s and the p here will do that. That's what we call the s and p mixing. So the effect is that for the smaller nuclear charge elements, the pi ends up being lower in energy compared to sigma, which is exactly opposite in the case of the elements elements with the larger nuclear charge. So again, to summarize, what you want to remember is that if you're dealing with molecules that are formed by boron, carbon, and nitrogen, which are the ones with nuclear charge less than or equal to 7, then you're going to use this energy diagram. Whereas if you're dealing with oxygen, fluorine, and neon, you're going to use this energy diagram. All right, let's take a look at how we apply this idea to a number of diatomic homonuclear molecules in the second period. So this table here gives you all the MO energy diagram complete with the num correct number of valence electrons for each of these molecules. Now one of the most interesting thing you can uh, see here is how these energy diagrams can explain that observation that we started the molecular orbital section with, which is that nitrogen is diamagnetic. It's not attracted to magnetic fields, whereas liquid oxygen, on the other hand, is attracted to a magnetic field. If you look at the electron configuration of the molecules, you can see that in nitrogen, all the electrons are paired. So there's no single electrons, which of course also means that it's going to be diamagnetic. Whereas with oxygen, you can see that because of Hund's rule that states that single electrons have to be separated first in degenerate orbitals, that results in oxygen having these two single electrons, which also implies that oxygen will be paramagnetic. Now, the other thing that we note, of course, is in the Lewis model, oxygen is also a stable molecule. So if you end up calculating the bond order 
for oxygen, taking the number of electrons in the bonding minus the antibonding molecular orbitals and dividing by two, you'll find that the bond order is actually two, which implies that oxygen has a pretty strong bond. It's equal to a double bond, right? So both the fact that oxygen is stable and that it's paramagnetic can be explained using that electron configuration. Again, this is something that the Lewis model fails to explain about the oxygen molecule. Now, what about heteronuclear diatomic molecules? In the general chemistry class that I teach, I don't really expect students to be able to draw the correct MO diagram for these molecules. So for example, here's the one given for carbon monoxide. If I ask you questions about these type of species, you usually be given the relevant diagram or you'll be given enough information to know what diagram to use. Usually it's one of the two that I was showing you earlier for the homonuclear species. Let's take a look now at representing the molecules that are formed by elements in the second period of the periodic table. Here we're asked questions about nitrogen species, N2, N2+, and N2-. minus. So the first thing to do is to make sure you choose the correct energy diagram as we discussed. There's two different ones that you can pick. The nitrogen one is the one with the smaller effective nuclear charge. So that's the one where you have your pi followed by your sigma 2p. So that's important to keep in mind. Now, once we do it for all three of them, we're going to calculate the valence electrons, which is shown here. And then you're going to place those valence electrons starting from the lowest orbital first, all the way to the top. And don't forget that if you have degenerate orbitals, you're going to have to separate out your electrons one at a time. It's not going to be an issue in these electron configuration, but it may be in some other type of species. So once I do that, all I need to do is calculate the bond order to determine the longest bond. So all the bonding electrons in species one is going to be eight. And then the antibonding is going to be two. Remember, the antibonding are the ones with star in them. So it's really only this one right here that has electrons. So eight minus two divided by two gives you a bond order of three. For the next one, you have the same antibonding electrons, but the number of bonding electrons gets reduced by one because there's only one electron there. So that's seven minus two divided by two, which is 2.5. And then the third one, you have now two different orbitals that are antibonding that contains electrons. So the total of antibonding electrons is three. So eight minus three over two gives you also 2.5. So the longest bond then would be the ones with the smaller bond order. So which means that N2 plus and N2 minus would both have the same bond length and both of them are going to be longer compared to N2. What about paramagnetism? So we're going to again check to see which of these have unpaired electrons and the ones with unpaired electrons are N2 and N2 minus. So both of those would be paramagnetic, whereas the N2 would be diamagnetic. Let's take a look at an example of doing a molecular orbital energy diagram for a heteronuclear diatomic species. So here we're asked to apply the concept to Cn, which is heteronuclear, and Cn minus and Cn plus in this case. But we were told to use the energy diagram of C2. And this is what I meant earlier in the video when I said that you'll be given information to solve these type of problems. So because we're being asked to use C2, we first start with the energy diagram that represents carbon, which remember is the one where the pi 2p is lower in energy compared to the sigma 2p. Once you have that, you can then calculate your valence electron just as we've been doing for the other species. So we have 10 in one and eight electrons in the other species. Putting 10 in our energy diagram gives us this electron configuration. Putting eight gives us this electron configuration. So we're then asked to determine the bond order and then figure out which one has a longer bond. So for bond order, I'm going to calculate bonding minus antibonding. The only antibonding is this orbital that has electrons in them. So it's eight minus two, which gives us a bond order of three. With the second one, we also only have this one with electrons in them for antibonding. So in this case, the number of bonding or electrons is fewer though. So it's going to be six minus two, which gives us a bond order of two. So comparing those two, we would say Cn plus has a longer bond because it has a smaller bond order, weaker bond, resulting in longer bond as well. Now, it doesn't ask this question about magnetism, but we can easily check as well. Both species don't have unpaired electrons, so that means that both species are diamagnetic.